Former President Barack Obama, who has preferred to stay out of the public debate about the future political direction of the nation, has lately, however, he and his allies, been more vocal and explicit about contemporary political affairs. This being the case, now is as good a time as any to give an exposition of Obama's impact as president, what were the motivating philosophies that underlined his rhetoric and policy, and who he sees as his heir apparent, the Democratic Party leader. Obama's presidency can be defined as a marriage of the progressive view of history and government intervention and the gradualist method of deliberative democracy based upon consensus building, practicality, and optimism with regard to conversation and human reason. Obama as liberal progressive. As with almost any political word, the term progressive has its vagueness and opacity. Still, while this is the case, a general understanding of the term must be given before its application to Obama can make sense. I use the term progressive to mean a species of political liberalism, the political and economic system that emphasizes private property, individual rights, free speech, secularization, free trade, and so forth. In contrast to classical liberalism, which focuses more on unrestricted markets and small government, liberals of the progressive sort believe that government has an active role to play in the betterment of the nation, focuses more on self-transformation and expression in the cultural sphere, and generally accepts an optimistic, quasi-teleological philosophy of history which holds that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. Obama, with his rhetoric of transformation and his ambitious government intervention within his first 100 days of holding office, represents this tradition in an explicit manner. Let us start with Obama's rhetoric. In case this has been forgotten by now, Obama ran on a politics of hope. This hope, of course, was populist in tone and called for mass movement-based participation. But nonetheless, it was grounded in a fundamental optimism that Obama harbored from the very beginning of his political career. Thus, examples of this optimism can be seen in his many speeches. Quote, What began as a whisper in Springfield soon carried across the cornfields of Iowa where farmers and factory workers, students and seniors stood up in numbers we have never seen before. They stood up to say that maybe this year we don't have to settle for a politics where scoring points is more important than solving problems. Maybe this year, we can finally start doing something about health care we can't afford. Maybe this year, we can start doing something about mortgages we can't pay. Maybe this year, this time can be different. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. We are the hope of the father who goes to work before dawn and lies awake with doubt that tells him he cannot give his children the same opportunities that someone gave him. Yes, he can. This vision and hope and this motivation to change was never really meant to be radical in orientation. Despite the exaggeration of conservatives, in the expectation of those on the far left, Obama did not run as a radical, notwithstanding his community organizing background. In the above passage, the call for change and hope are tempered with calls for pragmatism and the setting aside of differences. Not only that, notice how in the above quote, Obama puts focus on the fact that government intervention can be the impetus behind positive social reform. This is a fundamental trope of Obama speechifying. What Obama usually does in speeches to give texture and substance to his progressive message is to link his project with a long-standing American tradition. This method makes explicit his idea that though the American project is ongoing, it is moving in the direction of the good, of expanded freedom, and of the blooming of industry and transformative technology. Hence, Obama says, Yes, we can. It was whispered by slaves and abolitionists 
as they blazed a trail towards freedom. It was the call of workers who organized, women who reached for the ballot, a president who chose the moon as our new frontier, and a king who took us to the mountaintop and pointed the way to the promised land. Yes, we can to justice and equality. Obama, in the above quote, points to the great government initiatives of the past, Kennedy's new frontier program, as well as the mass movement civil rights pushes like the civil rights movement for black Americans in the development of unions and the struggle for workers and women's rights. Again, he says in his inaugural lecture, Today I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. On this day, we gather because we have chosen hope over fear, unity of purpose over conflict and discord. There's also ample evidence that Obama was a progressive by the economic policies he implemented during the first two years in office. First, there was a $350 bailout, which was the second portion of the large bank bailout he enacted. For those questioning the progressiveness of the bailout, we note that it was based on Keynesian principles, the prevailing progressive economic system, antedating the rise of neoliberalism. Second, there were the auto bailouts, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, there was the stimulus package. The robustness of the government intervention that Obama shepherded is often underestimated. Commentators note that at their peak, the TARP program and associated reforms impacted over 97% of GDP and 59% of private sector debt. Obama's reforms were five times the scales of the ones implemented by FDR in his first two years by comparison. Additionally, Obama ran as a bipartisan pragmatist that wanted to bring the nation together. Or rather, more accurately, he wanted to unveil the illusion of our division, allowing us to see the vistas of our vast commonalities. In his keynote speech at the 2014 DNC, he proclaimed that even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United Obama, States of America. Obama, in his campaign, ran as a pragmatic progressive who believed in the project of democracy the capacity of government to make strong reforms and changes, and the grit and spirit of the American people. But though he contended that he would not push a hope that, quote, was about blind optimism, the almost willful ignorance that thinks that unemployment will go away if we just don't think about it, or that the health care crisis will solve itself if we just ignore it, he nonetheless underestimated the constraints of Washington politics, and this had a decided influence on the policies he implemented and how they were received. Obama as proponent of deliberative democracy. As is well known, Obama was the first black president of the Harvard Law Review. But many are not aware of why it was that he ascended to such a position. True, his natural intelligence and grasp of abstract concepts was one of the core reasons for his election. But the main reason that he was given his position was his commitment to the power of conversation and getting to know the opinions of those who disagree with him. This ability and orientation, among other things, exemplified Obama's commitment to the tradition of so-called deliberative democracy. In deliberative democracy, quote, claims on behalf of or against such decisions have to be justified to those people in terms that, on reflection, they are capable of, of accepting. The reflective aspect is critical because preferences can be transformed by the process of deliberation. That is, deliberative democracy is a dialogic form of communication wherein each participant in the democratic process has his ideas examined on their own merits with an open mind to changing their opinions. Hence, deliberators are amenable to changing their judgment, preferences, and views during the course of their interactions, which involve persuasion rather than coercion manipulation, or deception, end quote. This deliberative democracy can be understood as either a theory about how democracies should conduct themselves or a theory about the nature of democracy itself. 
the former use of the term will be operative here. Obama, throughout his career, made his commitment to deliberative democracy known both implicitly and explicitly. Still, the best and clearest statement of his commitment to this theory comes in his book, The Audacity of Hope. Quote, The rejection of absolutism implicit in our constitutional structure may make our politics seem unprincipled. But for most of our history, it has encouraged the very process of information gathering, analysis, and argument that allows us to make better, if not perfect, choices. Not only about the means to our ends, but also about the ends themselves. Whether we are for or against affirmative action, for or against prayer in schools, we must test our ideals, visions, and values against the reality of a common life so that over time they may be refined, discarded, or replaced by new ideals, sharper visions, deeper values. Indeed, it is this process, according to Madison, that brought about the Constitution itself through a convention in which, quote, no man felt himself obliged to retain his opinions any longer than he was justified of their propriety and truth and was open to the force of argument, close quote. Obama's ability to manage ego and anger and his belief in the value of the rational process of deliberation were both traits that he kept within himself throughout his ascension to the highest office. But once there, they proved to be impediments to his success. Deliberative democracy requires good faith and a commitment to reason and persuasion by all parties involved. However, the GOP was not committed to reasoning with Obama, but to defeating him. Obama came into office with a belief that he would change the very structure of the way Washington worked. This desire would impact the way that he would conduct himself during three central policy debates, health care, financial reform, and immigration. On health care, despite the fact that the bill that would become the Affordable Care Act, ACA, was in some ways a reform project that originated in conservative circles, and despite the fact that Obama strove for Republican participation, the ACA was passed on a partisan vote. This notwithstanding, Obama would say, quote, it, the ACA, is a plan that incorporates ideas from senators and congressmen, from Democrats and Republicans, and yes, from some of my opponents in both primary and general elections. But what Obama said in the above quote is on its face true. It's still a bit misleading, for deception encompasses more than outright lies. For it draws attention away from the astounding fact that the ACA was the first major piece of legislation in United States history to pass by a strictly partisan vote. No Republican voted for the ACA. This being the case, the fact that Obama passed a bill which did not include single payer or a public option was disheartening for the left, especially since he axed these proposals in part to garner Republican support that proved chimerical. Moving to the financial terrain. The battle over the stimulus package was just as partisan and showed the limits of Obama's deliberative approach to government just as clearly. One synoptic example of this can be found in the following anecdote. Dave Obey, chair of the House Appropriations Committee at the time, asked Jerry Lewis, the committee's ranking Republican member, what GOP members would like to see in the stimulus bill. Lewis laughed at the proposal noting that he had orders from above not to vote for the bill. Still, some Senate Republicans were interested in Obama's ecumenical approach and said they would be more inclined to vote for the bill if it included more tax cuts and less spending. Obama agreed, and Charles Grassley negotiated the deal, but then voted against it himself. No Republican in the House of Representatives voted for the bill. On the immigration issue, too, Obama encountered strong opposition from his political adversaries. No Republican voiced public support for immigration reform, and all but three Republicans voted to filibuster the DREAM Act, which would allow a path towards citizenship for undocumented minors. The result was that Obama had to use executive action to implement the DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and DAPA, Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents programs. It was the immigration battle and the subsequent battles over gun control that tested Obama's patience on the issue of the method of deliberative politics. It is a striking fact that the man who once said that the law, 
and by extension the Constitution that embodies it, records a long-running conversation, a nation arguing with its conscience, end quote, had now dispensed with discourse and acted by fiat, quote, to those members of Congress who question my authority to make our immigration system work better, or question the wisdom of me acting where Congress has failed, I have one answer, pass a bill, end quote. It is the tragedy or blessing, depending on one's politics, that it took to the end of his first term before Obama realized that consensus building governing would not be effective as he'd like. But by the time the realization had dawned on him, his control of the House and Senate loosened and deeper legislation reforms would no longer be possible. The failure of Obama's presidency, especially in his first term, which would prove far more consequential than the second, particularly in regards to his negotiation with the GOP, was a result of the optimism and hope that underlined his progressivism with regard to government and history and faith in reasoned discourse and consensus building. Despite Obama's protest, this hope was hollow. Obama's was not a blind hope, but a myopic one, an optimism that did not realize that hope is a possibility and not a promise, and that true hope has at its core the consciousness of despair. To be sure, Obama spoke as if he believed this, but his conduct showed scant evidence that he accepted this fact. Hillary Clinton, in the throes of her campaign against Obama, once fought back tears saying that, quote, You know, I have so many opportunities from this country. I just don't want to see us fall backwards. Regardless of what one thinks of Clinton, the point of this anecdote is to show what a true acknowledgement of the possibility of decline, failure, and regression looks like. More evidence that Obama's understanding of hope was problematic could be found in the fact that he could not envision the idea that he could be succeeded by Donald Trump as president. A question arises then, has Obama, now elder statesman of the Democratic Party, learned from the mistakes of his presidency, or is he still committed to the same ideas? Let's move on and see. Obama's post-presidency. In his farewell address, Obama, in his role as custodian of a 240-year democratic tradition, tells the American people that, quote, in 10 days, the world will witness a hallmark of our democracy. I committed to President-elect Trump that my administration would ensure the smoothest possible transition, just as President Bush did for me, end quote. This was Obama speaking as the public-facing instantiation of democratic ideals. But when the heavy luster of public decorum faded into the twilight, Obama made his true feelings known in the darkness of privacy about his successor to the seat of Lincoln in Washington. He knows absolutely nothing, Obama is quoted as saying. He called Trump a clown, a cartoon, and most importantly for us here, leading up to the election, he could not envision the possibility that the American people would turn on him and elect someone so antithetical to all that he stood for. It is said that Obama wanted to retreat from the political spotlight after his tenure in office, but that the sui generis nature of Trump's election, especially his unprecedented attacks on a recently departed predecessor, and the fact that his former vice president was looking to upgrade his job title, had forced Obama's hand a bit. The question that is most important to us here is this. Has Obama, after countless battles he faced with Republican legislators, and the fact that he was succeeded by his very antithesis, began to question his faith in deliberative democracy and the primacy of reason and dialogue, his quasi teleological philosophy of history, and the radical hope that underlies it all. Hardly. This line in his farewell address sets the tone for his post-presidency very well. Quote, It is that spirit, born of the Enlightenment, that made us an economic powerhouse, the spirit that took flight at Kitty Hawk in Cape Canaveral, the spirit that cured disease and put a computer in every pocket is that spirit of faith and reason and enterprise and the primacy of right over might. Close quote. The commitment to the slow, incremental, but overall positive trajectory of the historical process and the use of reason as the guiding star of progress has made itself President Obama's latest pronouncements about the upcoming Democratic primary. As of this writing, Obama has not yet publicly endorsed any candidate in the race. However, 
There are those close to them who claim that a Sanders nomination would prove extremely disquieting. Some of the overt reasons given for this are that Sanders is not a Democrat, and thus, we can conjecture that he lacks a kind of party loyalty and solidarity to ideological tenets of the Democratic Party. This is a plausible but insufficient view. For those able to read between the lines, it's obvious that Obama's concern with Sanders rests on Sanders' polarized view of the political landscape. In his 2018 Mandela Lectures, Obama says the following, quote, So those who traffic in absolutes when it comes to policy, whether it's on the left or the right, they make democracy unworkable. You can't expect to get 100% of what you want all the time. Sometimes you have to compromise. That doesn't mean abandoning your principles, but instead it means holding on to those principles and then having the same confidence that they're going to stand up to a serious democratic debate. That's how America's founders intended our system to work. That through the testing of ideas and the application of reason and proof, it will be possible to arrive at a basis for common ground. Hence, it is not Sanders' populism that Obama takes issue with, but his so-called radical agenda, uncompromising policy positions. Sanders has been unusually consistent in his policy positions, though on immigration there have been some modifications. And the fact that he, Sanders, uses polarized talking points about the relationship of the wealthy to the rest of America. An additional reason given by the Obama camp for why he would not support Sanders is this. They seem skeptical that Sanders could win a general election. Those in the Obama camp say that his experience on the campaign trail in 2018 had convinced him that, quote, Democrats had to be careful not to mistake the passion and excitement on Twitter for candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for where the public was ideologically, especially in the coming general election against Trump, close quote. In fact, the Obama cap seems to have such a strong aversion to Sanders that Obama himself may in fact speak out against him if a Sanders victory seems imminent. Quote, yeah, if Bernie were running away with it, the Democratic Party nomination, I think maybe we, all those in Obama camp, would have to say something. Close quote. We note, however, that this skepticism towards Sanders' electability is not borne out in the latest polls, which have Sanders running ahead of Trump in the general election. This aside, now that the Democratic primary is beginning to round into shape, we are hearing rumblings that Obama is throwing his weight behind Elizabeth Warren. Furthermore, Recently, Warren has moderated her stance on health care, which brings her views more in line with those of Obama, at least insofar as process is concerned. The backing of Warren in contrast to Sanders is proof positive that Obama still stands by his political philosophy. Conclusion With my analysis done, it is a good time to give a few remarks about the general limitations of Obama's perspective on contemporary politics. Obama, like Bill Clinton before him, came of age in the shadow of Ronald Reagan and the ascendant conservative movement in the states initiated by Barry Goldwater. This being the case, his view of what is politically possible and feasible are circumscribed by this historical context. The basic point is this, left-wing politics must work within the framework of a center-right nation in order to be electorally viable. In addition to this, there is the fact that, as I stated earlier, Obama believes that Americans are not prepared for radical changes and moving too far to the left or right will alienate voters. On both of these fronts, Obama's perspective is questionable. With regard to moderation, the GOP was said to have an internal crisis after their 2012 defeat at the hands of Obama. The way forward, it was thought, was to moderate on issues of immigration expand the base to include more young voters and non-whites. But as we now know, the Republicans' party decided on Donald Trump, and his candidacy and election was itself a living refutation of this kind of analysis. What Trump proved, but Obama for some reason has not accepted, is that one can win a general election not just by broadening one's appeal, but by deepening one's base. Energizing those already on your side could prove to be just as viable a path to victory as running on a message of reconciliation and national unity. As far as the nation being sent to right is concerned, this is not quite true either. The nation has moved more to the left on many issues throughout the years, 
but just as importantly, due to the advent of social media and the diversification of media content, the Overton window has shifted a great deal since Obama ran in 2012, let alone 2008. Both the radical right and left have gained strength over the last decade or so. With the above objections in view, one wonders whether Obama's protestations to Sanders as the nominee are underlined by more than just politics. The evidence might suggest so. Obama chose Clinton as his hand-picked successor because he believed that she would carry forward his policy agenda in the way he wanted the agenda carried forward. Obama is extremely protective of the ACA and sees it as the crown jewel of his presidential legacy. Sanders, in contrast to Biden, and to some degree Warren, wants to introduce a Medicare for All bill that will be a much more radical step towards reform than the health care reform Obama implemented. There is no doubt that the next Democratic president has to radically alter the health care system after Obama's very recent reforms, that this will be seen as a negative judgment on Obama's signature policy. So when Obama says that Americans aren't ready for radical change, one wonders if he is speaking with the voice of the American people or to protect the legacy of Barack Obama. No doubt Obama likely thinks the two positions coincide, but this would be just another example of the confidence and exaggerated hope that would push a junior senator to run for and become president, but would also blind him to what would come to pass, both during and after his reign. Postscriptum I wrote this essay sometime in the winter of 2020, so I did not know what was to come. We have witnessed a naked, but somehow still sly, show of political power and acuity from the former president that, though telegraphed by the internal reports, was nonetheless still somehow shocking. The direct intervention into the race by Obama, his call to Mayor Buttigieg nudging him to drop out of the race, laid the foundation for Sanders' defeat. The question that is really important, however, is if Sanders' defeat, induced by Obama's actions though it was, actually proves Obama's theories about the political climate. The answer to this question has to be a mixed one. The exit polls in most of the primary states show that most voters supported Sanders' signature program, Medicare for All, though they still voted for Biden. And Sanders also won voters who cast their vote based on ideological concerns. I will concede that Sanders' defeat gives me some evidence to suggest that he would not have ran as strong as Biden in the general. For example, I do not think that Sanders would have won or even been that competitive in Florida in pre-COVID conditions. And to be honest, I think he would struggle there even during the current situation. To put it simply, I do not think that there are any states that Sanders would have won that Biden would not have. But I do think that there are some states that Biden would have a chance to win that Sanders could not. So, in the sense of understanding the narrow set of concerns of a class of older, more affluent, legacy media influenced voter, Obama and his cadre were correct. And since the affirmation class of voter has an outsized influence in the Democratic primary, Obama's analysis of Sanders' electability may well have been on target. Obama intuited that many Americans have grown tired of the fury and frenzy of the Trump administration and looked forward to nothing more than the vacuous, tranquilizing speech of a septenarian whose implicit promise is to slowly rock the nation into a state of political slumber. Still, regardless of if Obama was correct about the short-term prospects of Sanders' campaign, we still believe that Obama's politics are not the politics of the future. Is an outmoded view of political reality that does not take seriously the ossification of our institutions, the intensity of our polarization, the de-democratization of our policy construction, the extreme monopoly power of corporations, and some of the negative effects of global labor arbitrage. The Democratic Party is to be used as a vehicle to address any of the substantive problems of this nation, then it has to transcend the stale politics of Obama and his younger accolades like Buttigieg. Let Obama's legacy stand as a symbolic testament of the capacity of this nation to overcome the small-mindedness of ethnic parochialism and to elect a man that shared neither skin color nor lineage with those who came before him. We should also note his cool, analytic demeanor and high-quality speechcraft. But our praise must stop there. 
as a guardian of the military industrial complex and drone strike aficionado, as technocratic incrementalist and genuflector before the trivialities of big tech, and as naive statesman with a weak sense of realpolitik, Obama must be transcended. There is no need to look back to the bygone policies and politics that were dated even during the time that they were enunciated. After all, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change we seek.